So we've got a great story here in 2 Kings chapter 5. It's all, and the whole chapter is dedicated to this, this one event of Naaman the Syrian, who was uh, the captain of the host. He, was a, he, was, he worked, you know, he was the, the main general, whatever, for the army of the Syrians. And uh, he, was a, he seemed to be a great warrior, mighty warrior, someone who was well favored by the king of Syria, but he was a leper. And in the story, just a brief overview, we'll go through it verse by verse. You know, there's a, there's a, a handmaid that's been taken captive by the Syrians. She's a servant, and she's in the house of the king, and she's just like, well, you know, if um, would to God that Naaman was in, was in Israel because there's a prophet there that could heal him. So the king catches wind of this, and he sends him to, to go get healed. He sends him to Elisha. You know, of course, the king of Israel doesn't uh, understand why he's sending someone to be healed of leprosy because leprosy is a is a serious disease. Leprosy is one to which uh, you know many people just like once you become lepers, once you're completely just like become a leper, it's kind of like they get put off in the leper colonies and and set apart from everyone else. It's a real bad. Disease. I mean, we don't deal with it really today, but it was a plague that that would uh, you know kill people and their lives and. and just really um, ruin their lives from that point forward. And, and um, anyhow, so he has that. He sends him down. Of course, Elisha ends up healing him. And um, then we have that little incident with Gehazi there at the end. So let's get started in here. Verse number one, chapter five. The Bible says, "Now Naaman, captain of the host of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and honorable, because by him." The Lord had given deliverance unto Syria. He was also a mighty man in valor, but he was a leper. Now, I like the wording here, first of all, because it says that God is the one that still gets the credit for giving deliverance unto Syria. God, the Bible is very clear to state that God is the one that helped them out through Naaman. He was the one that he used. He says that because by him, which is by Naaman, the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria. So he was a mighty man of valor, right? It says that he's a mighty man of valor. You know, he's this warrior. He's the captain of the host. But at the end of the day, God's the one that delivered Syria. But of course, the king of Syria doesn't recognize the Lord. And we notice, you know, you could get this from this as well, is that God works with nations according to his will. Because, you know, even though Syria was a wicked nation, and the king of Syria didn't believe in the Lord, you know, and, and the Syrians, by and large, you'd say didn't believe in the Lord. But whatever was going on at that with the particular battle that they were, he delivered them out of, God determined that the other nation needed to be defeated. You know, God has his purposes and he has his hand in many of these things, whether we understand it or not. And he will use wicked nations to do his will. All, all the time he does that. I mean, it's not even, um, it's not like a one-time event. I mean, he uses, he uses wicked people to get his will done many times. But we see here, um, anyhow, I don't want to get too far off on that subject. Naaman... Mighty man of war, he, uh, he's brought deliverance, so he's well favored in the eyes of the king because he won this great victory. And um, But he's a leper. So verse 2 says, And the Syrians had gone out by companies and had brought away captive out of the land of Israel a little maid, and she waited on Naaman's wife. So the Syrians had gone out by companies. That means like that's their armies. And they had invaded Israel. And from Israel, they brought back, they, they got a captive, right? They brought back a slave, this maid. And uh, she waited on Naaman's wife. So I, I, I think when I was giving the overview, I said she was in a king's house. She was in Naaman's house. So as Naaman's wife has this servant of the, as the Israelites serving her as, you know, they, they went out to battle, brought home some captives and said, okay, we've got our own personal servant now in our house. And... Um, Verse 3 says, And she said unto her mistress, Would God, my Lord, were with the prophet that is in Samaria, for he would recover him of his leprosy. Now, um, now we see here, you, could, you know, and again, without getting too, I don't want to get too far off course here, but this is, this is a, um, a little maid, a younger, a younger girl or woman that's, that's been taken captive. But just by her statement here, you can tell she probably wasn't treated that bad. You know, like, 
We have that. We we conjure up thoughts. I'm not. I'm not saying I promote slavery or anything like that. But we have a tendency to think that just every single person who's ever had a slave is this wicked person that's like whipping them in their backs until they can't do it. You know, like and just 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 beating people down all the time. Which did that happen? I'm sure it happened. But was that just the norm? No, I don't think it is. I mean, um, you know, everybody that had a slave or, or you know wasn't just some some horribly wicked person. It was just, those are those are the way things were in those days, and you know a lot of people didn't you know didn't see it as being well, whatever. Again, I don't want to get all off on the on the whole slavery thing, but we see here just because she's making this statement, you know, would God, my Lord, were with the prophet that is in Samaria? She cared about him. She cared about him having leprosy enough to say, hey, if he were in Samaria, there's a prophet there that could heal him. There's a prophet there that's capable of healing. And they took her seriously. Verse 4 says, And one went in and told his Lord, saying, Thus and thus said the maid that is of the land of Israel. And the king of Syria said, Go to, go, and I will send a letter unto the king of Israel. And he departed and took with him ten talents of silver and six thousand pieces of gold and ten changes of raiment. It's a significant sum of money he's bringing with him. One, this shows you how much the king really cares about Naaman, right? How, how in high regard he treats him, say, okay, you know, and, and how valuable it would have been for his leprosy to be healed. 6,000 pieces of gold, 10 talent, you know, a talent is, is, uh, was a heavy unit measure. I don't know the exact measurement of it, but it was, it was a pretty heavy uh, amount. And then, um, you know, pieces would be smaller than a talent, but 6,000 pieces and ten talents of silver, along with the ten changes of raiment. He's like, bring all this to, you know, and we're going we're gonna to see if we can get you healed. Because if someone could heal you there, it's worth all of that stuff. And that's what he's sending him with. And then verse 6 says, And he brought the letter to the king of Israel, saying, Now then this letter has come unto thee. Now when this letter has come unto thee, behold, I have therewith sent Naaman, my servant, to thee, that thou mayest recover him of his leprosy. It's kind of a funny story, because if you think about it, there's this little maid that just says, you know, would to God, you know, the, the, my Lord was, was with the prophet in Samaria. And just saying how he could heal her. So then the king hears this and he's like, well, I'm going to write a letter to the king of Israel. The king of Israel hears this and he's like, what in the world? Like, why are you sending me a leper to heal a leper? And his first thought is just like, obviously... You know, no one knows how to heal lepers, so he's picking a fight with me. Because he's just saying, oh, yeah, heal my servant. And then he's, when he comes back and says, I can't heal your servant, he's going to be like, oh, mad. He's going to come and declare war or whatever. So he just thinks he's picking a fight. That's why he says, um, verse 7, he says, And it came to pass, when the king of Israel had read the letter, that he rent his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and to make alive that this man doth send unto me to recover a man of his leprosy? Wherefore, consider, I pray you, and see how he seeketh a quarrel against me. A quarrel is a fight. So he's saying, look, this guy just wants to fight with me. When, I mean, obviously he should have been sending him straight to Elisha, but, you know, that's the way the kings deal with things. You send him to the king. king doesn't know, um, again, has no faith and, and doesn't even think about Elisha or think about a man of God to actually heal him. He's just, his first thought is just, low. no, he's just trying to start a fight with me. Verse number 8, And it was so when Elisha, the man of God, had heard that the king of Israel had rent his clothes, that he said to the king, saying, Wherefore hast thou rent thy clothes? Let him come now to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. And these are things that God has used, and he's used it in other, in other times too, just to make sure that people know, hey, they're going to know that there's been a prophet among them. Why? Because these, these miracles are being done. Why? Because God is showing his mighty hand in the land or the nation or thing. He's saying, you know what? Send them to me. Yeah, I know you can't heal them, king, but why don't you send them over this way? We'll let them know that there's a prophet in the land, that God is working in Israel. Verse number 9, So Naaman came with his horses and with his chariot and stood at the door of the house of Elisha. And Elisha sent a messenger unto him, saying, Go and wash in Jordan seven times, and thy flesh shall come again to thee. And thou shalt be clean. But Naaman was wroth and went away and said, Behold, I thought he will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and strike his hand over the place and recover the leper. 
Are not Abana and Farpar rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel? May I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. And his servants came near and spake unto him and said, My father, if the prophet had bid thee do some great thing, wouldest thou not have done it? How much rather then when he saith to thee, Wash and be clean? Now, there is a lot to learn from this one aspect of this story here. Uh, where I'm going to try to, to go through this in a little bit more detail. But what happens is, is that he shows up to He's excited. He's showing up to Elisha. Remember, the king sent the letter. And Elisha's like, send him to me. So the king must have responded and said, okay, here, go to Elisha. So now they've got to be thinking, hey, I'm going to be healed of my leprosy. So he shows up to Elijah's house, and Elisha, what is he, does he come out and meet this greatly honored, you know, captain of the host, and, and, and treat him with all, you know, he sends a messenger to him. Elisha himself doesn't even come out. Doesn't even come out. He just sends a messenger and says, okay, yeah, here, go, go tell him, just, just go tell him to go wash in the, in the river seven times. And that's what he says, He's, you know, go, go wash in the river Jordan. And, uh, so this makes Naaman really angry. He says he's wroth. He has a lot of wrath. He's extremely angry. Say, you know, he's basically just like, what? Like, why did I even come here? You know, this stinking, dirty river of Jordan. He's like, these rivers of Israel anyways, isn't the, the, the rivers of Damascus like 10 times better than these rivers anyways? Like, like if I'm going to go get clean by just washing off my leprosy, why would I go into this river to do it? Isn't there better rivers to do that in? And this is his attitude, Right? And look at what he says in verse number 11, when it says, But Naaman was wroth and went away, and he said, Behold, I thought. So this is what Naaman had in his mind. He's going to this man of God that's supposed to heal him. And he already shows up with his preconceived ideas of what's going to happen. He has this whole thing played out in his head of what his expectations are going to happen. It's going to be this glorious event. He says, look, he says, I thought he will surely come out to me. So first of all, he got that wrong because Elijah just sent a messenger into him. So I thought he will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and strike his hand over the place. And recover the leopard. So he's like looking for Benny Hinn. <laughs> Seriously, this is what he's thinking. He's, he's thinking, you know, like, oh, by the name of Jesus. And he's going to smack him in his head, and then his leprosy is going to be gone. This is the way the unsaved world looks at it, though. This is the way they look at these miracles and men of God and stuff. They, that, this is why so many people get deceived in the Pentecostal movement of these, these so called healers that are nothing but frauds. Because that's what they see. They see these people doing it. Oh, wow, that must be what, you know, what a man of God does. And that's why he gets mad. He's just like, washing the river. Like, what are you talking about? But Naaman built up in his own mind what he thought a man of God should be like. And what he should say. And what he should do. And that preconceived idea almost cost him his healing. That literally, got, I mean, the difference between him being completely, fully, 100% recovered of his leprosy and not hinged on just his ideas and notion of what he thought should happen. Instead of taking a step back and saying, well, if, if what I thought should happen, why do I even need to go to this guy? I mean, just go to anybody then, right? Just find the person who's going to fit the bill. But you can't do that because they're not going to offer real healing. Now, one of the things I think this demonstrates is a very clear picture of salvation. Most people think, well, salvation can't be as simple as, say, dipping yourself in a river or taking a drink of water or walking through a door. It can't be that easy or just believing on Jesus. That's, that's just too easy. And it took a while. We're giving a gospel to someone out soul winning this, this evening. And that, that, I mean, it wasn't a serious hang up for her, but it was one of those things where it's just like, she kept on going back to just, well, if you're really sorry and you're repenting and you're doing his work and you really got to just try to follow you and all this stuff. See, people want to believe that 
and, and, and trust that, no, it's got to be harder than that. There's got to be more involved in me being saved. It can't just be as simple as accepting a free gift. No, I've got to work for it. I've got to do something for it. You know, God's not going to just accept if I will. You mean I could just go off and sin then? Oh, you mean, you mean that if I just kill somebody that I'm still saved? Yes. Because it is that easy. But people have this preconceived idea of what they think salvation should be, of who they think God is, of what they think is required without actually just going off of the word of the Lord. What did God actually say? What must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. It's, it literally is that simple. But when you have this preconceived idea of who you think God should be, what you think a man of God should say, and what you think the message is, see, you're not ready to be taught. You're not ready to receive. You just, you just think you've got everything right. Well, Mr. Leper here thought he had everything figured out. And he almost lost, you know, what didn't even receive his, not lost, he almost didn't even receive his salvation. His cleansing, his complete and utter healing of his wicked body that was immersed in leprosy. People call what we believe easy believism as as a a slanderous remark to, to make fun of. And ridicule. Oh, you think it's that easy? It's just it's easy believism. And they expect some great event, you know, like like they think that every person gets saved is gonna have this event like like the Apostle Paul on the road to Damascus, and there's this big bright light shining, and there's a lot of weeping, and all the, you know, this huge event, and some strong burning feeling in their heart and everything else. Look, that doesn't happen. And a lot of people, that's what, that's what they're expecting and that's what they're waiting for. I'm just waiting for God to just, you know, when I'm in my, in my room at night, to just show me what's required. And, and see, you could, and I know this because I've knocked on these people's doors that are waiting for that. And it's like, God's talking to you right now through his word. And it's being explained to you how easy it is but you're not going to receive the cleansing, the healing, because you already have in your mind that you've made up what you're expecting to have happen, what you're expecting should happen for your salvation instead of just receiving it from God's Word. Elisha was speaking on the name of the Lord, on behalf of the Lord. And, and was telling him what he had to do. And it was the truth. And it wasn't until Naaman's servants... You know, I mean, he's, they're basically like, look, you came all this way to see Elisha. He's supposed to be the man that can heal you. If he would have asked you to do some great thing, if he would have said, you got to climb to the top of this mountain, you got to jump through all these hoops, and do, wouldn't you have done that? And he would have. So of course. Then why not something so simple? You know, we in relation to salvation, you think about what would a man give in exchange for his soul? I mean, what would you do? Like you would do if you're thinking right, you would do anything to receive eternal life. It's not bad to have the attitude of I would do anything for it, but not by rejecting the simplicity of the gospel. Amen. Just because you're willing and you would be willing to do whatever God told you to do in order to receive that eternal life doesn't mean you have to cling to, well, then I must have to do something because I would be willing to do anything. Right. You just have to do what's right, what, what you're told, what, the, what God said you need to do. What Elisha, the man of God, said he needed to do was just dip himself in the, in the River Jordan seven times. That's it. That's all he had to do. It wasn't a great thing. It wasn't a big deal. It's actually really easy to do. We need to make sure there's also a lesson here, besides just salvation, that we, um, we don't let our expectations get in the way of the truth. Whatever the expectations are. I mean, it may not be, you know, for so many people, and what this story demonstrates, it it does come in the form of salvation. 
So many people have some other ideas in their head that get in the way of just what the pure gospel says. But there's so many other aspects as well that we don't want to, we want to make sure that, well, I thought this was going to happen, this was going to happen, this is going to happen, and then just give up on what God's word actually says. Or let that shake your faith. Let that deter you because, well, I thought, you know, some people, uh, I think a lot of, a lot of things, uh, a lot of people are going to be dismayed when Jesus Christ comes back, when the tribulation starts. Because they have this idea in their head, oh, I thought Jesus was going to come and take us, why, why are we going through this stuff? Why is this happening now? Well, you can't let your preconceived idea deter you from the word of God. And don't get angry about it and just, oh, well, then maybe the Bible's not even true then. No, maybe you just go back to the truth and say, what did I miss? Right. right. What am I not seeing here? Right. So when you have the preconceived ideas, because look, it's bound to happen to us. It's, you know, we're, not, we're not perfect. We're not going to have everything all figured out exactly right. But don't get the attitude that Naaman did at first of just getting angry and throwing up his hands. Oh, forget all this stuff anyways. No, just do it right. Let's keep reading here. Verse number 14. Then went he down and dipped himself seven times in Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God. And his flesh came again like unto the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. Very descriptive words are used. Even even uses like the flesh of a little child, meaning that, I mean, he was completely clean to the point of just brand new life clean like just no spot no leprosy nothing pure complete purity in his flesh again another picture of that salvation and think about this too he also had to because he thought it was something else because he thought it was a different way because he thought there was going to be a different way that he needed to be cleansed he had to humble himself and just do what he was told. Do what was right. And in order to receive salvation, but putting your faith in Christ, you have to humble yourself and just admit it is just believing. It really isn't by anything that I have to do, any great work, any great thing that I have to do in order to be saved. If there was a great thing, I'd be willing to do it, but I have to admit that no, there isn't a great thing. That's not a part of me being healed. He humbled himself and he dipped himself. Verse 15, And he returned to the man of God, he and all his company, and came and stood before him and said, Behold now, I know that there is no God in all the earth but in Israel. Now therefore I pray thee, take a blessing of thy servant. But he said, As the Lord liveth before whom I stand, I will receive none. And he urged him to take it, but he refused. Now this becomes a, a you know a transition into the next point and the things that happened with Gehazi, but um, just picture what happened. The guy's really happy, of course. Naaman's happy. He's like, now I realize there's a God in Israel. Like like he is the God. Israel, the God of Israel, is the true God because no one else could do this amazing healing. And, and he was, I believe, he got saved in this moment at this this event. Because he came there expecting something else. He humbled himself. He, I mean, physically, yeah, he got cleansed. But that led to his faith on the Lord. That led to him just realizing, you know what? The Lord is the true God. So because he's so happy, he wants to give him a blessing, give him a gift. And hey... You know, thanks. Take you know, take take this stuff. You know, and, and it makes sense. I mean, think about if you guys. If someone healed you, obviously you'd probably be extremely happy. But it's like, oh man, great. What can I do for you? Give you this and give you that. But Elisha, Elisha refused. So why did he refuse? First of all, he's demonstrating that God is the one getting the credit for the healing, and not Elisha. Which is a very important thing to, to make sure. I mean, this is something that's being taught in the Bible, but it's also just being reinforced here to Naaman that, no, the giving was being done to you, not any payment coming back from you, um, you know, for your healing. He's, and um, the fact that God getting the credit, I think, um, 
is, uh, is also the reason why it did, he wasn't healed in the way that he thought he would be. Because the way that he thought wasn't, it really wasn't that far-fetched when he said he thought that I, you know, he will surely come to me, is what he said, and call in the name of the Lord his God, and strike his hand over the place and recover the leper. There have been other men of God, like Moses, that have done things almost identical to that. Right? Where he called on the name of the Lord, he had his staff, he smote the rock and water came out. Or, you know, things to that effect. Where God used them in this way. So, was, I mean, obviously there's a point of, of who I was making earlier, it's completely valid, but his thoughts, if, if Elisha were to do that, and especially in this case, it would be a lot easier to misconstrue of Elisha having the power and not the healing actually coming from God. Right? So like if he's the one kind of doing this, because I think what this story is telling us, not that there haven't been men that healed people in the New Testament and laid hands on people and healed them and things like that, but what this story specifically is showing us is the salvation by grace through faith. And it's showing us, even up to him refusing any payment for what he did, no, God gave you a gift, it's a gift. It's completely, you know, you don't have to pay anything for it. Take that. So he was, and he was showing grace. Grace, of course, is unmerited. And as thankful as he may have been, the items he brought with him were meant to be a payment. So like when he brought with him that stuff, it was, it was intended as a payment. Now, after he was healed, he may not be thinking of payment and just being happy, want to give it to him. But nevertheless, what, what he brought with him, the, the talents of silver and the gold and everything else, that was supposed to be excuse me, a payment for him to be healed. And the healing was not bought for at all. And Elisha was not going to allow that to be bought for. Accepting any form of payment cheapens the grace that was bestowed upon him. Also think about this, and this is, we're going to get into a few more verses a little bit later when, uh, when Elisha rebukes Gehazi for, for going after him and taking some, some wealth and some money. But, I mean, really, it's literally like this, and, and those of you that go out soul winning will know exactly what I'm talking about. If you go out and, and give the gospel to somebody, and they get saved, imagine them like trying to give you a hundred bucks or something. I mean, I, I don't know about you, I, I would never take a gift from somebody that I just gave the gospel to and got saved. I would completely refuse that every day, like just every single time. Not that that happens, right? I mean, <laughs> but it would make sense if it did. If someone's like, wow, I'm so thankful. What can I do for you here? Just, you know, say, no, 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 no. I'm bringing you the gift of God. I'm bringing you this grace. I am not going to accept your, you know, any financial gain or something that you're going to try to give, bring to me. Because that's exactly what was happening here. You think about it like that. Oh, yeah, it makes perfect sense. Let's keep reading here. Verse number 17. And Naaman said, Shall there not then, I pray thee, be given to thy servant two mules burden of earth? For thy servant will henceforth offer neither burnt offerings nor sacrifice unto other gods but unto the Lord. And that's what makes it clear. He's converted in his heart. He's believing. He's like, I'm not going to offer. I'm not going to do anything for any other God just for the Lord. Verse 18. In this thing, the Lord pardon thy servant. But now he knows. He's thinking about this. He just made his statement. He said, you know what? From here on out, I'm not going to you know, offer anything unto any other God but unto the Lord. And I think what happens is he thinks about that. And he goes, oh, wait a minute. He's like the king's right hand man. So he knows he's going to be in this situation now with the king where before it didn't matter because he was a heathen anyways and he would go in and worship some false god. It didn't matter. He wasn't saved. But now he's thinking like, I know the true God. So now he's like, well, wait a minute. Now I know what this means. So he asks Elisha a favor. Verse 18 says, in this thing, the Lord pardon thy servant. He says, forgive me in advance. That when my master goeth into the house of Rimmon to worship there, and he leaneth on my hand, and I bow myself in the house of Rimmon, when I bow down myself in the house of Rimmon, the Lord pardon thy servant in this thing. And he said unto him, Go in peace. So he departed from him a little way. Naaman, I believe, like I said, I believe he just got saved. And it's, it's, it's evident, it's clear. He already knows that there is no other God. 
and he knows the routine of going to church with his master, right? And that he's going to be bowing down. I mean, you can think about this as him going to a Catholic church. And he's going to lean on my hand when he bows down to that statue of Mary, right? And, of course, because he's there with him and because the king, you know, worships his God, he's going to expect me to bow down with him also. And what he's saying is that I know this is wrong. I know that that's not God and I shouldn't be bowing down to worship him, but please just pardon me when I do this. Now, he's preemptively asking for forgiveness. Does that make him not saved? Because, well, he's not willing to turn from all of his sins. I mean, if he is willing to turn from all of his sins, then he wouldn't do that, right? I mean, if he was truly saved, then he definitely wouldn't be bowing down before any other God. But is that what the Bible teaches? No. He believed. Now, should he have chosen to not bow instead of asking preemptively for forgiveness, going into something he knew was going to be wrong? Of course he shouldn't have bowed. Of course he should have had the faith like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that was able to stand up when everybody else was bowing down and it was certain death for them to say, no, we're not going to bow down because we believe the Lord our God. And he told us not to bow down, so we're not going to do it. Naaman didn't have that level of faith. But you know what? He had saving faith. That's right. He recognized that the Lord is God. He put his trust in him. And he knew what he was going to be doing was wrong. Don't get deceived by the people who want to, who want to throw, oh, where's the fruits of his, of his salvation? He's already going into sin. He was able to recognize everything that was going down. And, he's, and he wasn't strong enough in his faith to be able to say, I'm going to make this stand against the king. And he needed, I mean, he's a babe in Christ at that point. Right. Right. He's a newly saved believer. Do you expect a brand new convert to just have all faith, to just conquer every sin and every persecution and everything? No, of course not. And did Elisha just completely condemn him? No. No, he wasn't, I mean, he didn't say it wasn't a sin or anything, but he said, he just said, go in peace, right? He didn't lay into him and didn't say, oh, do you really believe God? Let's keep reading here, verse number 20. So he sends him away. And, um, and he's on his way now. Verse 20. But Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, the man of God, said, Behold, my master hath spared Naaman, the Syrian, in not receiving at his hands that which he brought. But as the Lord liveth, I will run after him and take somewhat of him. Now, I don't want to read too far into what uh, Gehazi is saying here, but he calls him Naaman, this Syrian, Obviously, the Syrians and, and Israel were at war quite a bit with each other. And he's looking at him as just like, well, why is he letting this guy go? You know, he healed him, and now he's not even taking what he brought for him. You know, like he's just going to let this Syrian go away. So he's like, I'm going to go after him. I know, I'm going to go take him. He's got an evil eye. Verse number uh, 21, so Gehazi followed after Naaman. And when Naaman saw him running after him, he lighted down from the chariot to meet him and said, Is all well? So Naaman's still just like, I mean, he's excited, right? He's like, oh, hey, is everything good? You know, what's going on? What do you need? What can I do for you? Verse 22, and he said, all is well. My master hath sent me. So here he's lying, lying through his teeth. My master hath sent me saying, behold, even now there be come to me from Mount Ephraim, two young men of the sons of the prophets. Give them, I pray, the talents of silver and two changes of garments. So he said, well, I'm not asking for that much. Just, just a talent of silver and, and two, you know, two changes of garments. That, that's all he's going to ask for. right? When he's stealing, he's thinking, well, I'm not going to steal that much from him. Verse number 23, And Naaman said, Be content, take two talents. And he urged him and bound two talents of silver and two bags and two changes of garments and laid them upon two of his servants and they bear them before him. So Naaman's happy to do this, of course. I mean, he was happy to give him everything before. So it wasn't a big deal to him. But look at what Gehazi is doing. Now, one, he's screwing up, in my opinion, what... what you know, this idea, this concept of grace. I mean, this is like, 
you're at the door, you get the person saved, you know, your silent partner standing there, this person's trying to offer you some money, and you're like, no, 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 thanks. And then you guys walk away, and you know, you're going, I'm going to go get a drink, and your, your soul winning partner goes and takes off, and it's like, hey, wait, I, I know, you know, he said no, but he actually needs to get a drink right now, so can you, can you give me like 20 bucks? That's what Gehazi did. And just totally lies, totally, you know, just goes off and... It's not the time for that. It's not the time or the place. That is completely inappropriate. And, you know, as servants of the Lord, one, God's going to reward you for the work that you do. We're not receiving rewards physically on this earth for preaching the gospel. And we're going to see here, I mean, I got, I got a lot of verses. I, well, not, not a lot, I got a few verses I want to go to. But look at... Um, so he gives them the Gehazi, right, in the, verse number 24. And when he came to the tower, he took them from their hand and bestowed them in the house, and he let the men go, and they departed. So he sends some people there to, to, to go with Gehazi back to, back to his house and say, okay, you know, to deliver everything, make sure everything gets there just fine. And then he sends them away. And he does all this, he's thinking, behind Elisha's back, right? Like, Elisha's never going to know. He let this guy get away. I'm going to get some of this money. And, and this change of clothing for myself, which guys, I did nothing, absolutely nothing at all. I mean, if anyone would deserve anything, it would be Elisha, but not, I mean, of course that's inappropriate. So then he gets all this stuff and then he, and then he kind of sneaks back into the, you know, back into where Elisha is, right? As if nothing happened. Verse 25. But he went in and stood before his master and Elisha said unto him, whence comest thou, Gehazi? Oh, so where are you coming from, Gehazi? And he said, thy servant went no whither. So, uh, what do you mean? I didn't go anywhere. You know, trying to play it off and just continuing to lie. Where'd you come from? Uh, I didn't go anywhere. I've been here the whole time. And he said unto him, went not mine heart with thee when the man turned again from his chariot to meet thee? Is it a time to receive money and to receive garments and oliveyards and vineyards and sheep and oxen and men servants and maid servants? He said, is it the appropriate time? Turn, if you would, to Acts chapter 8. Keep your finger here. We're almost done. It's been a shorter sermon this evening. I've got a few verses I just want to share with you regarding this topic of, of the you know, appropriate time and why this is completely not appropriate. I think it's relatively obvious, but I think there's other, other examples in Scripture also given about um, the, you know, the, the complete inappropriateness of receiving money for doing God's work. Um, from the people you're helping, from the people you're ministering to, right? It's one thing for the man of God, for the priests, for the Levites, for, you know, for someone to be taken care of, for the evangelist to be taken care of by a church, by people who are supporting the work that he's doing and receiving some type of benefit in that sense of being supported. But it never is it coming from the people you're helping. You're not taking of the hands of the people that you're directly, you know, ministering to when you're going out and doing the work of the Lord and winning souls and stuff like that. You're not getting it from the people you're directly healing. Acts chapter 8, verse number 18. We're going to see the story here of Simon, who is a sorcerer. And many people like to turn to this and say, see, Simon never really got saved. But the, but the chapter says that he believed. He believed on Jesus. See, he, he was a sorcerer, and he had bewitched the people, and they thought he was some great man of God because he was doing, he was like using magic and, and into witchcraft and stuff, and he was able, he was, he was into sorcery and had people deceived. But when, uh, when the apostles got there, they, you know, they're actually preaching the word of God. This guy hears it, and he gets saved. He believes. But then in verse 18 is where we're going to start reading here. It says, and when Simon saw that through laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me also this power, that on whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. So, from an outsider's perspective, not necessarily the worst thing that he's asking for to be able to give the Holy Ghost, but his intentions and his heart is all wrong. And he's completely rebuked for this. Don't forget, he's already been in this, in this as a sorcerer, someone that people looked up to and, and, and had some form of power. Right? Now he sees a power that 
is completely unlike any power that he had before. By laying out of hands, people are getting the Holy Ghost. They're able to speak with other tongues. They're you know healing people and stuff. He's just amazed, blown away by this. Wow, I want to be able to do that too. But his heart's not right at all. And then he's even offering money, saying, "Well, hey, how much? How much can I give you? How, how much can I give you to give me that power so that I could lay hands on people and they can receive the Holy Ghost?" Say, you fool, that has nothing to do with money. You think that you could get the gift of God and, and this stuff, but you know, and that's what they answer. Let's just read what they answer him here. Verse number 20, But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. You think you could purchase a gift of God with money, you fool? Of course not. Say, your money perishes with you. Money's nothing. Just spit on your money. God's gift doesn't get purchased with money. Verse 21, Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent therefore of this thy wickedness, and pray God that perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. For I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. Now, people will point to that and say, See, he wasn't saved because now he's saying he needs to repent. Because believing isn't enough. No, no. Anytime you sin after you're saved, you should still repent, no matter what it is. This guy got saved, but guess what? He sinned. Oh, well, there's something new, right? Someone's saved and then they sin? Okay, sorry, I didn't know you were so perfect. Repent of thy wickedness. That's what he needed to do. But I mean, here's another man that thought, just like Gehazi, well, similar, a similar concept. It's not, it's not an appropriate time to be paying for something. You know, as opposed to receiving, this time he's trying to pay for stuff. It's like, no. You know, that's not right. And we're talking about God's work here. It's not, it has nothing to do with the money. Uh, Matthew chapter 10. Turn if you go to Matthew chapter 10. I mean, Proverbs 23, 23 says, Buy the truth and sell it not. Also wisdom and instruction and understanding. Our job is to, yeah, we buy the truth. If, 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 we, if we need to spend money to get something like the Bible, like God's word, I mean, you go out and you get this stuff. When we find the truth, we ought to be willing to give what we need to get the truth. But we don't. once you have it, you don't sell it to people. You give it away for free because it's the truth. And that's what that's the point of the proverb there is just telling you, look, get the truth, right? Spend what you need to spend to get the truth, but give it but don't sell it. I mean, give it away. Matthew ten, verse number seven. This was Jesus sending his uh, his disciples when he was sending out his disciples two by two to preach. He says, And as you go, preach, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. Freely ye have received, freely give. The work that they're doing when they're healing the sick, cleansing the lepers, raising the dead, and casting out devils, he's saying, you don't charge for this. You don't accept money for this. You've been given this gift for free, and you give it out for free. And that's exactly what Elisha did. He cleansed a leper. He said, we don't take money for the cleansing because I've received this gift from God for free. I didn't pay God for this gift. He just gave it to me so I could use it to heal other people. I'm not using this gift for my personal gain. It's for the glory of God. And when you, when you start mixing in your personal gain with God's glory, you're taken away from God's glory. Turn, if you would, now to Exodus chapter 20, because the other, the other point, um, the other aspect that's brought up here, I mean, it's the same, same thing, but um, I was just going over, is it a time to receive money? It's not the right time based on what he's doing, but now we see also the, the covetousness, the clear covetousness of Gehazi. And... I, it's not a coincidence that Elisha adds all of the, the words that he adds there because he says, because what was he getting? Garments and money. That's all he got, right? But what did he answer to Gehazi? He said, is it a time to receive money and receive garments, the two things, 
and oliveyards and vineyards and sheep and oxen and men servants and maid servants. You know why he was bringing up all those other things? Because in Exodus 20, verse number 17, the Bible says, Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. I think that's similar enough to the Ten Commandments, Thou shalt not covet, that he's throwing all this in there saying, You know what, Gehazi, you're coveting. You are wicked, and you've got a wicked heart. You're guilty. You're, you're coveting these goods that don't belong to you. You don't deserve them at all. You go out in false pretense. You lie about it to get yourself this wicked gain. And that's why, the, as a result of this covetousness, the leprosy, verse, uh, sec, back, back in 2 Kings chapter 5, the leprosy therefore of Naaman shall cleave unto thee. And unto thy seed forever. And he went out from his presence a leper as white as snow. The last illustration of this whole story is covetousness is like a disease. And it'll kill you. Naaman was cleansed of his disease for his, you know, putting his faith in uh, in the word of the Lord. But now we see Gehazi, which by any accounts you you may, you know. He was Elisha's servant. You could say he was saved, right? I have no problems with that. Sure. He did a lot of things that, were, that weren't right, but I mean, it was, he was the direct servant of Elisha. Why not just assume that he was saved? I would guess that he was. But the covetousness in his heart destroyed him. Not just him, it destroyed him and his family. Because it says that the leprosy of Naaman shall cleave unto thee and unto thy seed forever. He really blew it. And that's where covetousness is going to get you. Wanting the things that don't belong to you. Look, I already went over this last week on Sunday, just a few days ago, how covetousness is one of the sins that's going to get people kicked out of church because it's that wicked of a sin. It's one of those things that's listed in extremely wicked sins. Adultery and fornication and drunkenness and covetousness. It's not something to be taken lightly. Don't be setting your eyes on the things of this world, on things that you can't have and things that you shouldn't have and the things that you should be receiving. Naaman, his his eyes were enthralled with the silver and the changes of raiment and the gold. And he's just, wow, look at... He's bringing all this stuff and you didn't even take anything? It's not appropriate. And that covetous, that covetous heart, turn if you would to 1 Timothy chapter 6, the last place I'll have you turn, and we're done. Covetousness is like leprosy. It's going to eat away at you. You don't even realize it. The Bible says in 1 Timothy 6, verse 8, real popular passage, and having food and raiment let us be there with content. See, Gehazi wasn't content with what he had. He let his eyes wander to those things that he didn't have and wanted them and wanted them and wanted them until it destroyed him. Verse 9, But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare. So people that want to be rich. If you're sitting here tonight and you want to just be rich, if that's your, in your heart, like, man, I just wish I had all this money. I wish I was, I was rich. I wish I had a lot of money. And be, you know, listen to me. Don't say, well, what's the big deal about that? I don't understand. It's because you've been brainwashed. Because you watch too much of that crap on TV where they, they throw up the cribs and, and you know, showing people rich people's houses and everything that they have and all their goods. And they glorify it so that it gets you to look at them and be like, oh man, I wish I lived there. I wish I had that. I wish I had all these things. Instead of being content with what you have. But look what the Bible says. They that will be rich. Does it say they may fall? Or it's possible? No. It says they fall. They that want to be rich, your desires to be rich, they that will be rich, fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts. Many lusts. Many things are going to be going after now. It's not just money. It's going to be many things foolish and hurtful. They're going to harm you. 
having those lusts and those desires after these things when you're covetous is going to hurt you. Which drown men in destruction and perdition. Verse 10. For the love of money is the root of all evil. Not a root of many evils. The root of all evil. Evil is when bad things happen to someone else. When you do something bad to someone else. Covetousness. The love of money. It's that heart. That love in your heart of of just wanting riches and money will drive a person to do any, you know, all kinds of hurtful and foolish lusts. Evil. That's where the rapist comes from. Starts with the love of money. That's the root. When you go back down to everything. Why? Because they're coveting. Because they want something they don't have and they're, and they're greedy. And then, oh, here's a woman. There's something else I want. Here's another lust that I have. That I want and I can't have. And they go after and they hurt people. And when people have this lust for money, they don't care who they step on. They don't care who they hurt in the process as long as they get money. That's the end. But see, this is the the root. You know, the end is hurting people. The root, where it all starts with, is in your heart and that love of money. The love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. The foolishness of wanting riches, it stems from you wanting to have something so that you're happy and glad and oh this is going to fix all my problems and my life is going to be so much better with all of this money and in reality it does the exact opposite it says when you want to be rich and you're and you're seeking after that you're going to pierce yourself through with many sorrows now look there are time, there are people in the bible that have been blessed by god like job who was given many things but his heart wasn't greedy after and have a love of the money and the things. And it's evident because when he lost all of his stuff, what did he say? The Lord has given, the Lord has taken away, blessed be the name of the Lord. That was his heart. Amen. That was his attitude. Did he, did he have his heart set on all his stuff? Absolutely not. Did God bless him with a lot of stuff? Sure. Having the stuff doesn't make you wicked. You may be blessed, you may not be blessed. I mean, there's people in all different types of financial situations. The problem is when your heart is seeking after and coveting after just, I just need to add more money, more money, more money. Money is going to be the solution to my problems. Wrong. It's going to cause you more problems. Amen. Cause Gehazi some problems. In the end, you think it was really worth it? Two talents of silver? And two changes of garment to become a leper for the rest of your life and on your children. Think about how, think about your children alone. How much your children worth to you? It's a strong statement being made. This isn't just some random story given for no particular reason in the Bible. There is a lot to be learned here, a lot of truth to be learned. And it's not some big stretch to apply it to the things I applied to tonight at all. It it perfectly lines up with all the other teachings in the Bible. And I think we need to take heed to this. And I I praise God for him giving us a story like this to help us just give us one more way to understand these concepts. And to understand what you know, the, the truth behind the you know, salvation being so easy and free, not getting caught up in, in having our own mind just thinking, well, this is how God should be acting. Right. This is how a man, you know, let the Bible dictate that. Right. And then being aware of covetousness and greediness and not just being content with what we have. Let's bow our heads have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your words. Thank you for the great teachings in the Bible. Dear God, I pray that you would please just work in our hearts. Help us all to have a, a, a heart where we are content with the things that we have, Lord. I thank you so much for the abundance of blessings that we have, especially just being in the time we are and in the place we are, dear Lord, in the United States, that um, we're already reaping benefits and blessings from previous generations and 
people that have served you, dear Lord. We pray that you would please just, um, regardless of the things that we have, that we would still have the right heart to serve you. And God, I pray that you would please just uh, also help us to be sincere in our in our search for your words, and, and uh, that we wouldn't be blinded by the th- by any preconceived ideas that we have that are false about uh, your character, about your nature, and that we would just um, just continue to seek in, in honesty what, what your word says. In Jesus, in Jesus' name we pray, amen.